I'm Peter Half, and uh, I'm very happy um, to again be able to uh, visit the house. It's a great institution that, um, in my country, we, the U.S., we have no, we have really nothing like this, <clears throat> and it's a great pleasure to uh, experience the hospitality of the of the house and of all the staff who make everything run very smoothly here. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so triggers, um, the, the technosphere, and I'll show you a picture of the technosphere in a minute, is a very complicated thing. And uh, it, it can't have any one trigger, I think, but one can try to identify some piece of it that one could maybe trace back to a trigger, and that's what I'll, I'll try to do. Um, so let's see, how do I do this here? Okay, well here's the, here's the, here's the technosphere. Um, it's basically, see it has some people, let's see, where is, it has some people in it, and it has some technological stuff in it. And so the technosphere is the sum of all the people in the world or at least most of them, and all the technological artifacts or systems in the world. And importantly, um, they're connected. We have the, the radio connections that Mark was just uh, talking about, and there's the highways, personal greetings, letters, and touching, and so on, all these, all these connections. And I would like to focus on the connections as the, as the locus of something we could try to identify a trigger for. Uh, Oops. And so, um, over the connections are, are certain flows that move between the parts of the technosphere. And I want to focus on one of those flows uh, to try to find the trigger of, of interest. Uh, energy, every, every system needs energy, so there's oil and electricity flows along pipelines and power lines and so on. Uh, that's an important flow. Another one is mass flow. There's a material flow, economic goods, um, and just people moving around. There's a flow of mass as well. On the streets in Berlin, there's a lot of flow of mass, I found, it's slowly getting from one place to another, um, but very beautiful. And then third here, which is what I want to focus on, are flows of information. Uh, energy is necessary for the system to work, the technosphere to work, or any system to work. Material and mass is important for maintaining it and growing it, and information is necessary to kind of coordinate the use of energy and mass to build up something as complex as, uh, as, as the technosphere. And especially I want to focus on digital information, and that's what those little zeros and ones are supposed to represent. Uh, and in the latter part of the 20th century and on up today, there's been an explosion of uh, digital information and digital, digital knowledge, and that's been pointed to earlier in this, in this session. And um, so the point I want to make about digital information uh, is in this slide. You can ignore these. This is my working draft of constructing this slide, and uh, I forgot to erase these notes here. Um, anyway, uh, so information is produced, generated, processed, transmitted, stored at basically higher rates than ever before in the history of the, of the technosphere in the last number of decades, and at higher volume, meaning a larger number of bits per second of generation stored, transmitted, and cheaper with the decreasing number of... Uh, Energy units per bit of information required a decreasing number of joules amount of energy or a decreasing number of euros, the cost, the economic cost per bit. And, uh, and why is this? Well, there's a number of reasons and I want to focus on a couple of reasons for this kind of increase in the flow rate and, and, and amount of energy generated, transmitted and manipulated and stored. Uh, f f look at one trigger, um, an important trigger, I think, for uh, that phenomenon. And 
one of the triggers has to do with the word digital up here in that we're dealing with digital information. Zeros and ones, bits. Digital information is basically information as a commodity. That all information looks the same except for the order of zeros and ones. All information, whether it's in a book, it's in a, it's in a painting or a photograph or it's in some database that's sitting somewhere or in historical information that's dug up by ar archaeologists. Um, uh, once that is in a digital form, it all looks the same except for the order of zeros and ones. And that means that if you have a system, say a bunch of computers uh, connected by, by wires and you can transmit and manipulate this information uh, through that system, it's digital information, but from one source, then you can do it equally well from any source because it doesn't make any difference to the system because the information is a commodity. It can always be treated the same way. And that's a fast, fantastic accelerating um, principle, I would say, to commodify something. And Jürgen Wren and I were talking about this morning, and he used the metaphor of, of, of fluidization. And I think uh, going to digital information is, in a sense, fluidizing information so that it flows faster. And uh, one that has various consequences, but one consequence is to essentially reduce the friction in the, in the system, to speed up the system, and uh, to allow it to function at rates that it was not able to before. So the digi digital is a key word. And then the other word that I haven't mentioned yet is e electronic. So I'm thinking about electronic digital information primarily. Do you have an electronic computer, electronic digital information? And that's the other focal point besides digital. And in electronic, I want to focus on the E in electronic. That is the E for electron. I want to focus on electrons. And the electrons are very small, and they have a very small mass. They don't weigh very much. An electron weighs maybe one, one part in 20,000 of, a, say, a carbon atom or something like that. Um, and it being so small, and so, so lightweight under the, under the right conditions, an electron can be moved by a very, very tiny force. And, uh, or an electric, a flow of electrons, electric current can be moved or perhaps stopped by a very, very tiny force or a very, very tiny investment of energy. If, if the electrons are in the right environment, and this right environment appeared in the 20th century. It's the transistor. And the transistor is a place where with a tiny amount of energy put in in the right way that the flow, in one example, that the, the flow of electrons could be maintained or it could be stopped. It could be on or it could be off. It could be a one or it could be a zero. And so, in the medium of the, of the transistor, the physical properties of the electron being easily manipulated um, with electric potentials and being very small mass and moving in the particularly forgiving environment of the, of the semiconductor under the right conditions. Uh, the, electron, the electron is, a, is, a, is the perfect handmaiden to, uh, to digital information. It's the perfect embodiment of digital information if you're interested in speed and economy. Economy in both energy and, and euros. And, and both of these effects um, work to reduce the apparent friction in the technosphere. So the old clanking friction of the early 20th century was lubricated by the by the transistor in this way, at least, energy, at least in terms of uh, information which could flow much more freely and then faster. And so the, uh, the information technosphere with the internet and social media and all that kind of thing are dependent on these processes, especially digitization and, uh, and, and the electron. So what is the trigger? Is it the, tech, is it the transistor? The transistor is a, certainly a reasonable trigger to choose for the modern, large, energetic, digital technosphere, or at least that component of it. 
But I want to go back a little further. Here is a timeline of the 20th century, 1900 to 2000. Here's the transistor in its modern form, um, invented in 1947 in Bell Laboratories. There were earlier premonitions of the transistor that it weren't patented and didn't quite take off uh, that were produced earlier in, G in Germany, for example. But uh, anyway, 1947 is the, the transistor more or less as we know it, as we know it today. However, I'd like to go back to the turn of the 20th century to the discovery of quantum mechanics. Now, quantum mechanics is the theory of the very small. For example, the theory of the electron is a quantum mechanical theory. And in 1900, Max Planck, the great German uh, physicist, published the first paper on quantum mechanics. It was really a hypothesis, but it was, a, in retrospect, was the first paper on, on, on quantum mechanics that started a trend in this was realized as an important idea. And people thought about it. And by the way, this was done in Berlin. So we are here at the trigger of the technosphere to a certain extent. And then for 50 years, nothing happened. It was a slow trigger, except that quantum mechanics began to develop into a, a larger, richer, more powerful tool to understand nature and to manipulate nature, especially at the atomic scale. And this was culminated in one way in mid-century, 1947, with the invention of the transistor. The transistor was one of the very first consequential, that is, important devices with this worldwide impact of what the technosphere is today and what we are, the world we live in today. The first, one of the first devices that required the knowledge of quantum mechanics for its invention. The other really consequential invention of this time that required a knowledge of quantum mechanics for its, for its realization uh, was the atomic bomb. I think the transistor is a more consequential discovery, at least up till now, um, in the history of uh, uh, humans, in the history of the, of, of the technosphere. So, we went up to the half century mark, and then within about 10 years, computers, which had existed before, actually a long time before, if you go back to the abacus, say, or counting on your fingers, but computers were, were beginning to be transistorized in the 1950s. Then in the 1980s connected together with uh, wire, <coughs> wires over a large distance, from, beginning to form the internet. And then many, additions to that to, to enrich the, the system. Uh, the World Wide Web invented in the late 1980s was basically a, a way to, for the average human brain, not for an expert or a scientist, but just anybody, the average human brain to plug in to the otherwise fairly inaccessible infrastructure of the internet. Internet being all this hardware and what have you out there, computers and wires, but how do you access it? Some person sitting in their house in some small town, how do they access it? Well, once an invention came up that could act, the human brain could plug directly into this whole internet, then the world changed. That would also be another potential, potential trigger and then social media and whatever built on, built on top of that. So uh, I guess I haven't been following my time. Um, so I, so I, I would choose the idea of quantum mechanics as the trigger for at least the information technosphere, although some of these other items on the list would also be fair game. Um, do, do I have another minute or I, I can stop there? If, do I have another minute? Um, let me just basically make this, uh, uh, this idea again, use this idea again for kind of a perspective on the 20th century. This is another timeline going from 1900 down to 2000 and beyond. And I think one way to think about how the, the transformation of the engendered by quantum mechanics was that prior to mid-century, there was nothing that anybody needed to know or that affected their life in any way that depended on 
a knowledge of quantum mechanics, except for the few physicists who were working on Max Planck's original idea to develop the theory of quantum mechanics. But the rest of the world went on without paying any attention. That's the classical knowledge technosphere. Classical knowledge means pre-quantum, non-quantum physics, non-quantum processes. So, so the world was in the classical knowledge technosphere. And then after mid-century, then the world was changed because a few people, and basically, you know, the number of people who know quantum mechanics in any depth is basically vanishingly small. But because a few people capitalized on that knowledge, the world changed to a state where quantum knowledge, the fact, it, the fact that somebody knew quantum mechanics and used it, basically changed the world uh, completely. We went from the classical knowledge technosphere to the quantum knowledge technosphere. We didn't go to the quantum technosphere. The technosphere in the world is always quantum, and quantum mechanics is there whether we know about it or not. But knowing about it changed, changed the world. And we could think that to finish up that in, in 1900, instead of a trigger, because this is so long for a trigger, 50 years, you pull the trigger, nothing happens for 50 years. It's more like a spark. A spark that lit a fuse, and the fuse burned. The fuse burned for 50 years, and then in 1947, it hit the transistor and exploded into the quantum knowledge technosphere that we have today. And, and one wonders what other sparks have already been struck and what fuses are burning at the present time and toward what future transistor are those fuses, fuses leading and what might that mean. But the world is always surprising. We don't know, we can't know those things. We just have to find out when they happen. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah.